for those of you that are on here. If I go back and uh, review any portions, you can do that as well. And uh, uh, before we get started with Mark, with uh, Mike, uh, you know, I listen to a lot of Mike's podcasts and just wanted to take a, a, a minute or so just to uh, talk about things. He always says a, a couple of topics just of what pays the bills. So uh, one of the things I wanted to ask of everyone here too is if you haven't worked with us in the last six months or so, uh, schedule a visit with us so that we can talk with you about uh, working with some of the data that you have and show you uh, how we can how we can help you. Uh, there's a, a lot of these meetings I have that we get a lot of type three knowledge out of them, uh, which I'll explain in just a bit. Uh, you know, there's three types of knowledge. There's the first one is what you know. And that's that's kind of easy because we know about things and we want to find ways of how we can do better and improve upon them, kind of like how we are here today with uh, what we're going to talk with Mike. And then there's the second one is what you what you don't know. And that's kind of easy, too, because it's something that you know you need to get knowledge about, but you don't have it. So you're going to actively go out and seek it so you can learn more about that and move forward. And the third type this is the most important one, if you want to write it down, is the third type is what you don't realize that you didn't know. And th those are kind of those aha moments that you find out just by uh, taking the time to learn, to learn something that you never even knew existed. Those can be the game changers in your business. And my experience in working with a lot of the dealers when we go through, they, there's a lot of comments. We never realized that we could, that we could do that. So I encourage you to, if we reach out to you to take the time and go through that, it will, you'll find value in it. So uh, I'm going to pass things over to Mike. He, uh, he was the author of the book that most of you got here. And as I said, even though it's a first time beginner's book that he, that he had, it was for me, it was kind of like a recharging of your batteries because what's most important is, is that there are really no new tricks. It's really a matter of, mastering the basics so uh i'm going to hand it over to the one and only mike weinberg the one and only the world is fortunate that's the case thanks chris <laughs> you're awesome i uh first of all good morning or good afternoon for those of you on the east coast by a few minutes uh i'm in the center of the u.s here in st louis thanks for joining me uh i don't know if you read the book or didn't read the book but we'll have lots of interaction here uh, i just want to say thank you to chris this is the second time he's done this where I had a book launch and he jumped on board and, and helped support the launch. Um, this was my most successful launch of the four, probably because I've been doing this longer and my platform's bigger and people like Chris and a lot of other executives really jumped in and, and supported what I was doing. Um, I'll tell you that I never expected to be doing what I'm doing now. This was not some life plan. This was not on my vision board. I didn't think people would know who I was or I'd get stopped in airports uh, by salespeople and they'd be handing me copies of my book. Um, I'm a sales guy that was really good at selling and hunting and bringing in new business. And I did that in a bunch of different industries and was a number one guy in a variety of companies and um, not through any choice of my own. I ended up in consulting the first time during a really weird stretch when the internet bubble burst around 2000 and got a chance to do some coaching and consulting and then uh, had gone back and played sales leader for, I don't know, maybe six or seven years. And in 2011, went back out on my own and kind of took advantage of some of the things that enabled you to build a platform on social channels. And I got noticed by some publishers and they asked me why well, I don't have a book. And my first book, New Sales Simplified, is what put me on the map and is a book that everybody knows. So it just kind of put me in a, a neat position. And fast forward to this book and why we're here today, um, I probably spend two thirds of my time now with senior executives or frontline sales leaders helping increase sales management effectiveness. Even though I'm a sales hunter by trade and my filter, like my, the lens I look through is always, how do we help people win more new sales? So I had the title of my first book was New Sales Simplified. A lot of salespeople are good at chasing, a lot of salespeople are good at managing relationships. Um, they're good at the technical, they're good at fulfilling demand, uh, not so good at being proactive, creating opportunities, putting deals in the top of the funnel. And so that's where I spent a lot of my time. But I learned the hard way. You don't transform organizations by training the salespeople. And, I, and the way I say it when I'm leading a workshop is if we, 
the people in this kind of meeting. If we don't get the big sales management stuff right, culture, compensation, accountability, getting the right people in the right jobs, like people who are suited to do what they're supposed to do and they, they're equipped by DNA and by nurture with the talent and the attributes that succeed in the kind of role. If we don't get that right, if we don't keep our good people, if we don't quickly address underperformance and coach people up or out, if we don't point the team with good strategy and, and make sure they're targeted on the right accounts, none of the sales training stuff matters. So over the past decade, I've really shifted my focus where I'm spending more and more time with leaders because of the multiplier effect. Because when we get the stuff I just listed right, from culture to comp to accountability to talent management, there's a multiplier effect and everything's a whole lot easier. So that's kind of what's my shift, which brings me to the new book. I have a book called Sales Management Simplified. And for eight years, it's been the best-selling and most reviewed sales management book on the market, which is what's provided me all these opportunities to go into companies big and small all over the world and do sales management training and consulting. And I'm loving what I do. And like two years ago, the publisher came and said, hey, we're going to do a book for new managers. We want you to write it. We've got this one really popular book called The First Time Manager, and we're going to build a franchise around that. And we're asking you if you would write the book for first-time sales managers. And they could tell from my reaction, I'm like, yeah, I'm busy. I'm not that excited about the idea. And they looked at me, and I've never really had a business conversation like this before. They said, Mike, we're going to do this book, and we think you should do it for your own sake. But if you don't want to, we'll give it to somebody else. And I said, I hear you. And to protect my spot, because I can't keep up with the demand for sales management consulting and training, I wrote this book and I tell you that because I couldn't be happier that they kind of forced me to, because it's my best book. It's my shortest and it's the crispest. And part of the reason I think it's my best is because I'm eight years smarter than when I wrote my sales management book before this. And I've been in all these companies and I'm seeing the dysfunction and I know what works and what doesn't in terms of accountability and coaching and talent management and connecting on the heart level. And if, if you've had a chance to kind of take a look at what's in that book, you see that it's very um, very straightforward and there's no fluff. And I basically repeat the same thing five times because there's about four or five things we need to do to win in sales. So there's there's my opening salvo. Um, I've got some slides prepared. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about common sales management sins and go over how to do great accountability without being a jerk or a micromanager and deflating people, but yet increasing transparency and visibility to the pipeline and getting the culture and performance you want. But this is, we got like eight people here. We could do whatever you want. I'm open to take questions. We can dialogue. I think I'm going to turn it to you right now and say, what would be helpful for you in this, this hour we've got together? What's on your mind or on your plate regarding sales management challenges or sales? And depending on what you tell me, I could grab certain slides or just kind of have a dialogue. So what will be valuable for you? I, I really appreciate Chris. And I wanted to, as a thank you for him purchasing all those books, I wanted to make it more valuable for him and his audience. So hence the offer to, to do this. So Chris, I'll turn it back to you for if you want to facilitate or I'd love to hear what's on their mind, biggest sales management challenge, or if they've dove into the book a little, are there aspects they want to cover a little more, me to cover more deeply or questions to take? Sure. Yeah, Mike, I, I, I think I, anybody I, can jump in if they have something in particular that resonated with them most, or they wanted to dive in and improve on any yeah, Mike, for myself, I have not read the book yet, to be honest. Okay. Uh, but like Chris said, that you don't know what you don't know, right? Um, I'm the president of the company, not the sales manager. I have a sales manager that does all that. But I always, whenever Chris sends something out, he usually has really good content and stuff. And I'm always looking to learn myself and seeing how I can support my team. And we're in a different market than we've ever been before. Um, so it's, it's just a matter of you, you gotta, you all you stay sharp. So you gotta learn what's going on out there. That's great. I mean, yeah. I do have, if I said for myself from reading the book, if I had to say the two chapters that I found the most valuable or most important on my end was chapter three, followed by chapter four, which chapter three was, uh, make sure that your people are doing your job, doing their job. And then number four was, uh, you know, how to help your people do their job better. So uh, we can talk about that if, uh, but if there are any other aspects that people have that they want to put on here for us to cover, let's bring it out now. We'll make sure yeah. we get to it. 
Yeah, I, uh, you know, in the last three years um, with COVID, our marketplace um, has had many, many people leaving the office. I mean, probably uh, the New York, New Jersey marketplace, half the offices are filled, if not less than that. Uh, people have merged, they've sold, they have, they're praying to get, be old enough to retire. And the, <clears throat> we've done a lot of uh, refinancing, a lot of refurbished equipment sales, pushing new whenever we can. But the greatest challenge is getting new suspects to become new prospects and uh, getting the salespeople to go find the opportunities. I mean, uh, one of the strategies we use is look at buildings where there are cars and, and go into the buildings that have cars. You know, you can do target marketing when you're looking for like wide format customers. Mm -hmm. I just signed up for Zoom Info, um, not the intent version, which is scary expensive, um, but that might be the next thing I go into. Um, but getting new clients is so critical right now and uh, taking care of your existing clients, keeping them, cross-selling to them, asking for referrals. Like getting new clients is such an important part of the business right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Let me hear what else. I'll come back to that one because it's it's obviously a huge topic, and there's a lot we can unpack from what Andrew even just stated. Um, other other thoughts or challenges that you want us to cover, and then we'll tie them together. Anybody who's not on Hi, this camera, is Jeff Ragusa. Hey, Jeff. I'm in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I we got a little bit different situation than New Jersey, obviously, but I think attracting new effective salespeople is my biggest obstacle. And then I also have somewhat of a, a tenured sales force when we're attract, trying to attract these new people, blending new with established salespeople and managing the entire team, uh, I think is a bit of a challenge. Mm. Can you unpack that last part a little further? Is it a challenge in terms of how to differentiate how you hold people well, accountable or coach, or is it trying to make the culture gel where you have old guys that aren't necessarily putting their arm around or mentoring newer guys? Uh, a little bit of both. I think my older guys are fine with the mentorship part, but y'all, you know, you're maintaining a consistent culture when you're trying to manage a 20 year veteran, been in the same territory, same company for 20 years versus a young guy who's greenhorn and just learning the ropes, obviously you can't do those things the same. And, and the balance between keeping them both accountable but not creating strife yeah, in the sales good. team. I'll specifically talk to that challenge with you because I, I that's not uncommon. And I'll, I'll tip my hand now and those of you who have gotten in the book, you'll see this. I am a very big advocate that we separate in our one-on-one -on -one meetings with our people, and even just as a philosophical concept, we clearly separate the act of doing accountability and holding people's feet to the fire and sticking their results and their pipeline, and if necessary, their activity under their nose, that we separate that conversation from the coaching and mentoring conversation because they're very distinct and they have different purposes. And I'll, I'll share why that's particularly important with new versus old and successful versus struggling people. Um, it's, it's probably one of the, probably the one most powerful observations I've got for you from doing this for a decade with sales leaders is who's winning when it comes to accountability and who's not. And how do you hold even veterans accountable without demotivating them, but also not letting them coast and be complacent because, and I'll just say this and I'll, I'm going to say it in an ugly way. There's a whole lot of salespeople who are babysitting an account list or a piece of geography, making a lot of money, taking orders from companies we've been selling for a long time. And they're not really driving new business. They're just reacting and fulfilling demand versus creating any. And we have got to force our best people and our, our more senior people to remain productive and proactive because we can't afford to keep paying them sales money for doing what I'll say is a glorified customer service job. And I'm curious if any of you, um, if I either pissed you off with that statement or 
you get like, yes, shout amen, because in any industrial company I'm in, and I've got a lot, whether it's John Deere Construction or uh, a big distributorship. I, today I was on the, on the phone with a big you know, CNC, high-end equipment company. They're all faced with the same thing. Salespeople that are doing a lot of farming and what I call zookeeping, uh, hanging on and loving and retaining and servicing, but not proactively creating. So I don't know if that's a, if that's relevant in your world or not necessarily. I'm curious for some feedback there. Definitely that's relevant. I, in, in my sales team, I've got uh, both of those going on. I've got the, the senior guy that's doing the right things and taking care of customers and selling new business. But then I've got another senior guy who's very unmotivated and goes through the motions, but he does enough to earn his salt. Yeah. But he's underperforming horribly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna, we're going to walk through that conversation with him in just a minute. I'll actually model that with you if you'd like. I think that will be helpful. Um, and Andrew, I'll come back to your point on targeting in a second because I feel your pain. And obviously, you're all in different geographies and have different challenges. I have this really simple framework for how to develop new business. And I'll just explain it to you right now. This is This is something I've made famous. I probably put this up on the screen 10 times. I'm in the middle of sales kickoff season. I've been in five cities the last two weeks in front of really big company sales teams all over the place from Scottsdale and Nashville to San Diego back and forth um, because it's sales kickoff meeting season. And I'm continually reminding everybody, your business may be hard and complex, but the act of selling isn't. And there's three pieces of the puzzle to win more new business. I call it the new sales driver. It's in chapter four of my, my book, New Sales Simplified. We got to pick our targets. We got to create and deploy our weapons and we better plan and execute the attack. And I can solve almost any sales problem, assuming you have basically the right people in the job and assuming that there's demand for what you sell. If you're not bringing in new business at the desired rate, the challenge is either we're not going after the right accounts or we, we've, we've identified the right accounts, but the people aren't really focused on them. And the right accounts could mean global existing or ideal profile prospects. Number two, we need, our people need tools. They need sales weapons. They need compelling messaging not feature, product, self, company-focused messaging, but messaging about issues we address and outcomes we achieve. That's like my favorite topic. I go more sales nerd on this than anything else. So the weapons, you need a messaging. You got to be able to get a meeting. We call that prospecting. And then when you get the meeting, you need to flip from this dog on a bone who got the meeting into this relaxed, consultative, discovery, value-creating sales person who can do good discovery and not sound like a pitch man or just a vendor pushing a product with a price. So messaging, prospecting, consultative selling, those are the three most important weapons. And then you can add presenting and proposing to that. And then the last piece, the framework, we got the targets, you got the weapons is now it comes down to planning and executing. What does the calendar look like? Is there enough sales math? Is there a business plan? Are there pipeline metrics? Are the salespeople holding themselves accountable and are we holding them accountable for number of new opportunities put in the pipeline? And if that's not working, then we have to dive into activity and go, okay, wait a second. Results aren't there. Pipeline's not healthy. How much activity you got? And my promise to you is if we're not bringing a new business at the rate we want, it's either we're not going after the right accounts, our weapons are weak, our story's boring, our prospecting's ineffective, we run crappy sales calls, or the last one is there's not enough activity. And we got, and I, I'll tell you, this is one of the biggest things. And I can't believe the money I get paid to tell executives this, but the number one reason most people aren't bringing in more new sales is they don't spend enough time working on new sales. They're working, they may work 40, 50 hours a week, but they're playing with their inbox and they're delivering parts and they're zookeeping, managing relationships or biting customer service buyers. They ain't selling. So I'll pause there. Cause I threw a lot out there, but that I just laid out for you. Like when I'm starting an engagement or I'm with a team who's struggling, I'm like, let's get the crap out of the way and talk about the basics. So I'll, I'll come back and talk about the talent management side in a minute, but questions or comments on what I just laid out in terms of the framework. And the reason I went down that path is because Andrew's saying they're having a hard time targeting. And what I would say as a coach is it's really hard to have a successful sales attack. If you don't know whose business to go after, because that's where it starts. Yeah, you guys so I'll open it up target. to the group in general. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that uh, there's a difference between busy and productive and making sure, you know, you all football teams, all professional teams, all do the basics all the time, right? It's like, I don't care how good you are if you're not doing the basics. And same thing, It's it, and our business is really a 90-day sales cycle. So whenever someone has a really bad month, I look back 90 days ago and go, what did what were you doing 90 days ago? And yes. they were mostly closing current business and zero prospecting. And now they're paying the price 90 days later because they didn't prospect before. That's so good. I'm about to put a slide up for you in a second. Keep more more thoughts on that. And I'll come back to uh to Kevin's 90 day rule because i I've got a very similar approach to that. And I'll show you a graphic that'll be helpful. Other reaction to my simplicity of the framework and trying to boil it down to if we're not bringing a new business. Now, the one piece I didn't mention is you may not have the right person in the job. And if you have if you have someone who's wired to babysit and zoo keep and is highly relational and low conflict and low risk, or someone who's making a lot of money for doing nothing, you may not see the hunger or the resistance to the to the, the proactive pursuit and the prospecting because it doesn't fit them. But assuming you have the right person and assuming your compensation plan isn't driving complacency, if you're not filling the funnel, it's either targets, weapons, or math. Yeah, um, I mean, we have had pro hunters, we've had pro farmers, and the ideal is a, a combo person. And uh, the the pro hunters can make a living, the pro farmers can make a living, but this job demands the combo person that is hunting and farming and taking care of an account base and trying to keep building that account base. And uh, they are far and few between. We do a heavy, heavy screening process mm -hmm. with our candidates. But even with our heavy screening process, multiple interviews, sales profile analysis, yep. going out in the field for half a day, we still have a one in six success rate. I believe you. And I'm going to show you a picture in a minute um, of a hunter and what I call a zookeeper. And I'm going to I'll make my case that it's very hard to find the unicorn that you're looking for. And I understand that you want both. I understand. I'm not going to tell you that's not possible. I'm just going to tell you we're all wired a little different. And people who are top producing salespeople, I will tell you across the board, have two characteristics. They're really competitive. They keep score. And they're not conflict averse. They're willing to push and disrupt and challenge and re overcome resistance. And people who are wired like zookeepers, who are really good at maintenance and service and relational they tend to be low conflict. And that is where, because I've seen it. I've seen hunters turn into farmers because they're they're making enough money and now they can go farm. But it's you almost never see someone who's a farmer turn into a hunter unless you step on their throat and they're starving to death. So it's and it's so it's a, Kevin, it's a hard I, I get you need both. I'm just saying it's really hard to find someone in this world that, that is gifted in both and, and has the discipline, which is part of why, which I'm going to go here in a second, and I'll show you some slides now. We have got to do great accountability. And if, if those of you have gotten this far in the book, I mean, it's the third chapter. The first chapter, I say, congratulations, in case no one told you this, you have the most important job in the company because you're leading the sales team. And a lot of you, you're leading the sales team and you're also the owner. So you're wearing multiple hats. In your case, it's even more important that you're a great sales manager because you're only doing it part-time. You have six other jobs. So in the few hours a week you have to play sales manager, I would love for you to master the two most important aspects, which are accountability and coaching. And the way I say it is we have two levers as a sales leader. One is making sure the people do their job and the other one is helping them get better at their job. So back to where I was going with the book, the first chapter I say, congratulations, you have the really most important job but the hardest job. The second chapter is me telling new managers, surprise, maybe nobody told you this, but all that stuff you did that you were really good at as a top producing salesperson that got you promoted to promoted to management, yeah, you don't get to do almost any of that anymore. Now you're in charge of the team, and instead of winning on your own, you got to win through other people. And it's not about you and your ego, it's about the team. So can you win through others? And that's part of the, the big theme in the book. So you have the most important job, you need to win through others. And then the first place I give advice is in chapter three, where I say your most important job. And I'm going to grab some slides now. And I'm going to, I want to start with the one that I, um, it might've been Jeff, I, the gentleman um, that talked about pipeline and the 90 day rule. I don't know if it was Kevin or it was, um, who said it, but 
I want to show you this this one graphic, and then I'll, I'll go back to the beginning of this section. I, I scrolled down on this while the other person was talking. You said, you know, if they're not bringing a new business right now, there's a lull. I'll call it the business is cyclical or your deals kind of, you know, your porpoises. You can look back 90 days because you could tell they were too busy trying to advance and close and not create. So let me say this as cleanly as I can. I preach this message everywhere I go. Your pipeline is everything. This is tomorrow's business. I, I'm big on looking at results when we're doing accountability, but we don't linger because we can't change the results. It's yesterday's news. What we can impact by coaching and accountability is the health of the pipeline. The, the quotes were putting out, the deals were actively working. And I say every day to somebody, there are three verbs that matter in sales. There's only three, create, advance, and close. We need our people creating new opportunities at the top of the pipeline, at the top of the funnel. We need them advancing existing deals so they don't go dark and we keep adding value and moving them forward. And then we need them closing the deals that are near the finish line. But I'm so intentional on this slide. And the numbers are generic for illustration purposes, but I, I want you to track with me. The reason our businesses go like this from a sales perspective is because the salespeople get distracted and they either get caught up in service work, farming and zookeeping and chasing invoices and running out parts, or with the discretionary selling time they have, they start out at the bottom of the pipeline and they spend most of their good sales effort trying to close what they can, which I totally understand. I'm a salesperson. They can taste it. They want to get it over the finish line. So they put their best effort in trying to close what's hot. And then with the little bit of table scraps of time that remain, they talk to people that have already shown some interest and they work on advancing those deals to a warmer stage. And you know where I'm going with this, right? Like, so what part of the pipeline, what part of the funnel gets ignored? It's the top part. And the reason the business goes like this is because they get all caught up on their underwear trying to close. And then they talk to some people that are active. And then one day they turn around and look up at the top of the pipeline and they're like, oh crap, there's nothing in there because I wasn't planting seeds. And what I'm doing here with the thirds, and I have an entire podcast on this very topic on my, on my webpage, you could find it. I call it the foolproof framework for consistent deal flow. If you force your salespeople, and I'll show you how to do accountability here in a second. If you force them to divide their time and attention across not just deals, but actually customers that are in all phases of the sales cycle, and those thirds are very, um, very practical. What if they limited themselves to a third of their selling time trying to close, a third working to talk to people that are already interested, but what would happen to the shape of your pipeline and the amount of new opportunities they would be creating if you force them to spend one third of their sales effort creating at the top? prospecting, proactive outreach, looking for referrals, going to networking events, popping in on people, all the behaviors that that fill the top of the funnel. I, I'll tell you what happens every time. The funnel gets fat because nobody defaults to prospecting in the top. So let me just pause in, in case you got a question or an observation from what I'm sharing. And I'm going to take you back and show you what's in chapter three, which is how to run a great accountability meeting without being an ass and without micromanaging, but totally transforming culture and visibility. So what are you thinking of the, just the simplicity of what I've got on the screen and what I'm preaching about these three verbs and dividing time and focus? Well, I, I think it's a good point because you, you brought up if you're not, uh, if you're not uh, focusing on all three, usually the top gets ignored and, uh, the other ones that are active or hot, whether you close them or they go away, then you've just got that imbalance. So, you know, the real thing is how focused can be on keeping that balance and that should so solve good, the problem. Because if we're honest, my, my client said this last week during the workshop I was leading. Most salespeople don't have trouble closing. If you do good discovery work, if you're showing up, if you understand the business, you identify their pain, you apply our right our solution to the result they need. Deals often take care of themselves if the pipeline's full enough. It's very rare a salesperson starving because they have too many opportunities that they can't move forward. That that's my observation. Most people starve because they don't put enough stuff on the top of the pipeline, so that every deal becomes so crazy important. So they sell like wimps, and they have a scarcity instead of an abundance mentality, and they look to discount and they don't follow the process because they're scared. 
in my world, I have more people that want to work with me than I can get to. Like I never uh, acquiesce when it comes to sales process and doing discovery. I'm filtering as much as they're filtering, like because I have more things in the top than I could get to. So I'm curious, any other takeaways or, or questions from this graphic? And then I'll go back and just talk about accountability at the macro level. Mike, the one the one thing I uh, that comes to mind, right, is because I still actively sell as well, is um, time management, right? Yep. Because it's it you're you're right. They spend too much time on the hot deals and not moving the other deals forward to get to the point of being hot. But as far as is that your theory as far as time management, one third of your time, one third of your time, one third of your time, or what do you what do you mean by the one third? Yeah, it's exactly what I mean. You're dividing your time and attention across all the customers and all the deals in all the phases, and the thirds are just generic because I don't know the specific situation. Right. But yes, most salespeople default to service mode, and then they work what's hot, and then they work what's active, and then they tell you I had no time to prospect, and that's why their pipeline is empty. Right. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. All right. So let me, I'll, 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 I want you to interrupt me here whenever I'm going to, I'm going to say some dramatic things in this, I don't know, five to 10 minutes when I review this, this framework with you. I'm not, I'm not trying to like, this is not hyperbole. I'm telling you a fact. What I'm about to show you is the number one thing that I see transform culture and results in companies beyond my coaching on sales story, beyond my coaching on technique. It's when the leader gets accountability right. I believe our number one job is making sure that our people do their job. And I'm always asking managers, executives, owners of companies, how are you holding your salespeople accountable? And I always get a crappy, nebulous, gray answer that's something like, well, you know, Mike, we talk to everybody all the time and we meet and I publish reports and everyone knows where they stand. And I'm like, really, that's great. Let me ask you a question. How often do you sit down and have a formal scheduled meeting where you review someone's results against their goal and where they stand on the team. And then you dive into their pipeline and you look at total pipeline coverage, number of deals, dollars of deals. Are they adding to the pipe? Are they advancing to the pipe? And then if you don't get the answers you want there, where do you say, pull out your calendar and let me see what you've been doing. And the order I'm going through is very, very important, but this is our most important job. And this is just my reminder that accountability is not dirty. So many people in leadership are like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to micromanage. I, you know, I've got adults. If I've got to supervise them, I don't want them on my team. I'm just going to tell you what I see. Management's an important part of the job. And when I left consulting and coaching, I mean, I had been a top sales guy in a lot of companies. And then I was a successful coach and consultant before I went into sales management and then took my first sales executive job. I was freaking clueless. I thought if I just taught people to sell like me and I coached them, they'd all be hungry and they'd all go get it done. And it was like this giant wake up call that not everybody wants to win or is as motivated as I am. And then a big stinking part of the job of leading people is actually making sure they're doing their job. And it's not micromanagement if you do it the right way. And this is my big reminder. And I, I, I can't say this any cleaner, right? It's not about work, which is why we're not going to start our accountability by asking about how much activity somebody had. That's counter, it's counterproductive. It's not helpful. And nobody wants to be micromanaged. Sales is about results. So we need to have, I use these three words with you. Regular, formal, scheduled. And here's my promise, and I'm not trying to be dramatic. If you implement this one thing, you will see some transformation. I have seen super veteran sales leaders, business owners, people that could outmanage me under the table, put in the framework that's in the book uh, in chapter three, on my website, there's a free guide on the homepage, mikeweinberg.com. At the top, there's a free guide that says the fastest way to increase accountability, reduce complacency, and create a high-performance culture. It's free. You just give us your email and you download this PDF and there's a link to a 15-minute video. And all the stuff in there is also what's in chapter three in the book. This is the highest payoff activity, sitting down with someone one-on-one -on -one and going through their results and their pipeline. And I want to just put three words here on the screen because this is where the difference happens. Regular means regular. There's a sequence to these meetings and people know they're coming. Part of the transformation and the culture and the expectation is your people understand that you're going to sit their ass down in a chair on a monthly basis. And for 10 or 15 minutes, you're going to shine a spotlight onto what they've produced and what they're working on producing. 
And that very act of knowing the meeting is coming is part of what changes behavior. The second conversation is that it's formal. This is not a text message or an email at two o'clock in the morning or, hey, quick thing when you pass it in the hall. This is, we're going to sit down and it's a planned meeting. And then scheduled means it's on the calendar. Like it's important enough that we schedule it so the person knows it's coming. And I'm telling you, the reason I'm being so instructive or granular in the way I'm saying this here, prescriptive, is because the managers that don't do this don't get the impact. Okay, so that's the importance of the cadence. What I'm putting on the screen here is the magic formula. This is it. This is the greatest thing I can ever show you. And I'm going to tell you something, and don't laugh, but I take no credit for this because I stole it. And in and all my books, I talk about this in the podcast. There's a man named Donnie Williams, was my sales manager, the vice president of sales I worked for in the 1990s. It's a guy I go to church with. We're great friends. We were business partners in the 2000s. I, he's mostly retired now. I still throw him a client once in a while when he wants to do a little part-time work. I worked for Donnie. I was the top salesperson in the company. But still every month on the 4th or the 5th, he would come down to my office with his reading glasses on the end of his nose, looking like a dork, just like this. At the time I was 30 and he was in his mid forties and he couldn't read. But now I have reading glasses in every room in my house and in every car because I can't read crap without him. And this is the magic. And I, I talk about this in, in the books, on the podcast and the video. He'd come in my office with a big smile and he'd sit down and he'd go, Mikey, how you doing? And I could tell, cause he had the legal pad with our deals on it, which was our company pipeline back in the 1990s. And he had the sales report in his hand, which was already on my desk because it was the fourth of the month and last month's numbers were out. And he'd sit down, never a bad word, never a threat, big smile. Mike, how you doing? And I knew it was coming. I'd play along. Donnie, I'm doing, I wouldn't even get two words out of my mouth. And he'd be like, never mind. Let me show you how you're doing. And he would look at my results and he would show me where I stood against my goal for what I sold last month. He'd show me where I stood on the team and where I was year to date. And we also talked about gross margin because I had some say in pricing and my deals and how many new customers I had acquired. And we would spend in this 10 minute meeting, two or three minutes on results. That was about it because you can't change the results. And this is where he was so smart. What he really cared about was phase two, the pipeline, because as I told you a second ago, here's that slide again, pipelines, the lifeblood of the business. You can't spend enough time talking about it. So we spent a minute or two on results, but then it was like, Hey Mike, what are you working? How many deals are coming in? Who Who's hot? You know, you guys said somebody, when you said you have a 90 day sales cycle. Well, okay. Then I need to know what's coming. Show me what you got in here. What percent of our deals do we typically close? Is there enough? I'll use a fancy phrase, pipeline coverage for you to make your number for the month. That's it. We asked the question. And then I like to ask these two questions because there's nowhere for someone to hide. And these are in the book and these are in the PDF. I'm pointing you to on my website. If every month you ask me, hey, what'd you create? What's new? What are we working on today? Because you put something in the pipeline. And then the second question is of the deals we already had in there, which did you get closer to closing? Which did you advance? And now they're warmer. And friends, I'm just telling you that the seven or eight minutes you spent on this, because this isn't a strategy review where you're coaching on every deal. This is, is there enough in there? And did you add? And did you advance? And I'll tell you what Donnie taught me. If you went over my results, whether my results were good or bad, we were going to talk about the pipeline because you were never allowed to coast. But if even if my results were bad and the pipeline was full and I was adding a lot of new deals, he'd be like, Mike, you're fine. How can I help you? But alternatively, and let's say, I'll give you an example. I missed my number last month. I was well behind. And he's like, no, that's not good. Let's look at the pipeline. Do you have enough deals brewing? And we look at it and we both agree. Not enough in here. I didn't create. I didn't advance. We're doing some guessing. I'm not going to make my number this month or this quarter. Then the meeting took a different turn and we went to the third phase. And this wasn't fun. But this is where he would look at me and go, hey, I'm not, I don't, this is my language I put on here, but I'm not cool with you failing and your results stink and your pipeline's weak. You've kind of left me no choice. And this is what I like to say. Why don't you grab your calendar and open the CRM and grab the business plan and your prospect list. And why don't you show me what you did last month? Because the results are poor and the pipeline's not good. What'd you do? How'd you spend your time? And not only what'd you do last month, but what's your plans right now? What does this week look like and next week? Because you've, you've asked for this level of inspection because I'm not seeing the, the pipeline health. And friends, what I'm telling you, Man. hang on one second. What I'm telling you is if you do this, 
you will experience these implications. You're going to change the culture. You're going to create incredible visibility. You will see where your people need coaching. You're sending a very clear message to underperformers. They're going to have to look you in the face or in the Zoom camera every month and answer for their crappy results and their weak pipeline. And people who are struggling, if you do this meeting every month, three or four months in, you know what happens? They either change their behavior because they realize they, they can't get away with it anymore, or they take themselves out because they don't want to be held accountable. And either one of those is a win for us, right? So this is a formula, and I'll stop sharing my, my screen here for a minute. Everything I just said is in that free guide on my website, and I unpack it and give you the why behind it in chapter three in the book. <clears throat> There's nothing simpler or faster we can implement. There's nothing that would make you as a business owner and part-time sales manager deliver the message about culture and accountability and results better than doing this little short meeting well. And it works best one-on-one, -on -one, not in the team meeting. And it works best when all you do in this meeting is talk about results and pipeline and activity. Don't start coaching them. The managers that don't get the lift out of this meeting are the ones that turn into a one-hour coaching session and start going through every deal and asking questions and then coaching them on messaging and doing all this stuff. I want them leaving the meeting. If you're shining the light of truth and you're trying to get the burden on their shoulders for their numbers, you let them leave the meeting with an uncomfortable feeling after the 10 minutes because part of what makes them change their behavior is they don't want to come back next month with an empty pipeline of bad results. They want to come back and go, hey, boss, look what happened. Look what I sold. Look what I put in the funnel. I'm feeling really good about this. And any salesperson who thinks this is micromanagement or that you're pushing it too far is not a salesperson because this is so far from micromanagement. We're not even asking them what they did or how they spent their time until they've earned it because the results in the pipeline were poor. All right. That was the best I've ever explained that in seven minutes as a little monologue. So I'm going to pause and we got 15 minutes left together. Mm -hmm. I want to hear your thoughts on this or your questions, and then I'm happy to talk about anything else you want to do sales management or even show you a list of common sins I see in other companies, but I want you to get value. So go ahead, Kevin, you can start us off. Me? Um, or Andrew, yeah. Or Andrew. Yeah, Kevin, it, Andrew. I mean, I can see two failings right there for us. I mean, we do have one-on-ones every two weeks with each of the reps and it's myself, the owner of the company and my VP of sales. <laughs> we go through... We go through the pipeline and the pipeline for us, we have a one to 30 day pipeline and 31 to 90 day pipeline, but we do want to know the next step in each deal and what is on, how we do give advice on, on log jamming things and come up with ideas and suggestions. So that's possibly one thing we're doing wrong. And then if the, if the pipeline or we call it funnel is too small, we do not dig into the activity and I can see that being a big problem. That's the accountability. That's the hard part on our part and it's the hard part on their part. Go get your calendars and let's go through what have you been doing? And and you know, Woody Allen said, half the, half the, the key to success is just showing up. Yep. And uh, we have people not showing up doing enough activity. That's the problem. And because you hold off, this is where Donnie, my mentor who created this was such a genius. Because you hold off asking about the account of the activity, everyone understands if you got there, they've earned that question, yeah. right? To your first point, what you're doing is very common and it's not bad. It's it's good to ask what's the next step. What'd you get the customer commit to? What are we doing? Like, I'm not opposed to that. And if you could do that in, in within the 15 minute meeting and it's still about results, I'm okay. What I've seen work is just say to someone, hey, you know, what? we're gonna do a separate meeting we're going to do a quick pipe and strategy meeting on your deals on a different day because you're only doing this accountability meeting like once a month where, cause you, you want this to be dramatic where it hits them. Oh my gosh, I'm way out. I'm way behind. My pipeline's awful. I got to get my ass in gear. This would be redundant to do it every week, but you might have that weekly meeting or biweekly meeting where you're going, let's go through your top 15. What's the next step? Where are you at? How can I help you? Let's strategize. Because I really, I mean this, this is the only meeting I want them leaving feeling bad about, but I want them leaving that one-on-one -on -one with like, oh, I crapped the bed. I got to fix this. Because the good salesperson, the competitor will come back to you next month and show you that they flipped it. And here's the weird thing. 80% of people love this meeting because it's short and it's focused and it helps them make money. The only 20% of the people that don't like this meeting are the ones that you're fleshing out from the smoke screen 
and they hate the fact that they're being exposed, which is exactly why we need to do it. So an hour meeting every two weeks is too much. For accountability. It's not too much to do strategy, deal coaching, sales skills, you know, I, but there's something when this little meeting is sacrosanct and it stands alone by itself and they go, oh, this is the meeting where I got to go in. In fact, I have one client in New Jersey, woman, brilliant young lady. She's so busy, family company. She's the executive, but she's also the sales manager. She's like, Mike, I don't have time to prepare for these meetings. Let's build a template using your framework, send it out to the sales team, have them come to me and do their own accountability. Her name is Amelia. The woman's brilliant. I helped her with a template. She sends it out the day on the last day of the month. On whatever day the reports come out on the 6th, she has all of her meetings. They come for 10 minutes each. They email her the document. They hand her a printed copy. They say, hi, Amelia. I'm here for my one-on-one -on -one meeting to go over results and pipeline. Here's what I booked last month against my goal. Mm, isn't it great? I blew it away. Oh, I didn't quite make my number. I'm sorry. Here's my pipeline. Here's all the deals I'm working. Here's what I added. Here's what I advanced. Here's what I'm projecting. And just in case you're curious, here's my activity against my named accounts. If you'd like to talk about that, it's all on one piece of paper. It's freaking brilliant. And she doesn't do any work. They show up and have to just tell her everything. So the, and I don't think it's busy work. It takes them 15, 20 minutes to get ready. I think it's brilliant to make them go through that process and have to then explain what they did or didn't do. And no one thinks that she's an asshole. No one thinks that she's some micromanagement bitch trying to destroy them. They're like, thank you for getting me focused. Because if they do better, they make more money. So I hope that's helpful. Well, I like the fact that you're talking about this particular meeting just being once a month, 10 to 15 minutes. That's it. They know what to expect. They know this is coming. So they're preparing for it all month. You know, and then you have your strategy meetings in between on literally helping them move things forward. But it's not the heat of that. And I do think that that in I've been in business 34 years and I've had many different sales managers and I do you the simpler something is the easier it is to do it and the easier it is to consistently do it so I like how your program is really simple not easy cuz it's not easy to consistently do this right but it is simple so you can, you can do it and I think the from my perspective in in sales is there's not enough time spent looking at people's calendars. You know, doctors book out their calendars six months in advance, right? A lot of times you look at sales reps and they have nothing booked out for the next two weeks. And my favorite, like, I love that. My favorite sales leader says this all the time. If your people wake up on Monday morning, whether they're working virtually or they're pulling out of their driveway and they don't know which way to go, we have a problem, Yeah. right? So I, I, that's brilliant. I love, I love how you frame that. And here's what I'll tell you, Kevin. And I mean this, like I didn't create this formula. I stole it and I've made it famous. Hey, I'm in I've copy never business. seen I copy everything. I do. I, and it, it, and it's everywhere. I can't encourage you enough to try this because I've seen it in great managers and in new managers in struggling ones and successful ones. It gives you insight into your people and it sends a message. And th that's the reason it's the number one thing I give away for free on my website. If you want that little five page guy, just go get it. And there's a 15 minute video. And what you already have in the book that Chris bought for you in chapter 13, it's at chapter three, it spells this out. And what happens is this, and this is the beautiful part. If you do this well, it takes care of the culture. It also f forces you to deal with underperformance because how many months in a row, I'm, I'm, I mean this to all of you, will you sit with a salesperson you have your 15 minute meeting and the results aren't getting better and the pipeline's not growing. And either that's because there's not enough activity, which means they don't care or they're not trying, or sometimes worse, there's a ton of activity, but it's not leading to opportunities in the pipeline and deals because they're incompetent. And then you can either decide I'm going to coach them up and I'm going to train them harder and hold them accountable more, or they can't do it. But what happens is you do this meeting three, four, five months in a row. You don't have a 18 month sales cycle. The salesperson who's not getting traction after four months of you putting their feet in the fire, they're telling you they don't care. And then it becomes a different conversation, which is chapter eight in the book, which is how do you coach up or coach out underperformers quickly? Because it make you, how long are you going to suffer the fool gladly where nothing's changing? It's the definition of insanity. So I, I can't, I can't stress enough how that works. Chapter three leads to chapter four, which leads to chapter eight. So if you have the meeting like you've described, 
-hmm. and you have to go to the activity because the pipeline and the results aren't there, would you recommend having a meeting sooner than next month? Rather, maybe after a week or two to, to make Great sure they're question. not driving off the cliff. If it's someone that you feel needs more supervision or because your sales cycle is potentially shorter where you can see enough traction in a couple of weeks that they could have had enough sales calls and created enough opportunity that it's worth that. As long as you don't feel like you're coming across like a micromanager, I would say yes. And I'll give you an example. I work with Paychex, the payroll company. Okay. It's a very, and I have their big, their big group, but they're, they're small business people. They are very quick transactional sales. They could go in and meet with one CPA and get a deal tomorrow, or they can call on a small company and have the owner go, yeah, I'm tired of my payroll service or we're tired of doing ourselves. My bookkeeper stinks or I'm with ADP and I'm tired of them screwing me. I'm ready. So that senior sales leader has their managers doing the accountability meeting every week and it's five minutes and they don't go very deep, but the, the business changes enough in five business days that they have to ask, okay, what did you close last week? And what did you put in the pipeline last week? And if I don't like that number, I'm going to ask you about your number of sales calls. Mm -hmm. So if someone's, if someone's failing or struggling, I think you can up the cadence to maybe biweekly, or if your sales cycle is really quick, you could even go more often. You just don't want to lose the impact. You don't want this meeting to feel like it's just another thing we do. It needs to be special. So I'll, I'll defer to your judgment on cadence, but it's not wrong to do this more often with someone who's struggling or if, if the sales cycle is shorter. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. You guys, it's fun. This is a fun conversation. What else would be helpful to chat about? I, we got five minutes left and I can stay a few extra, but what Mike, what is on your mind? One yeah. question, not related to new sales managers, <laughs> but as related to owners dealing with sales managers. Yes. Go ahead. You want to finish the question? Or you just want me to go broad? I want you to go broad. Okay. If your sales manager has more than one person on their team, so they're really managing a team. Yeah you need to have a very similar meeting with your sales manager every month. In fact, I have a document. If you email me, mike at mikeweinberg.com, I will send it to you. Okay. I took the framework that you're going to get in the free PDF on my site, or it's in okay. chapter three, and I slightly revised it for the executive to the manager accountability meeting because I get asked this all the time. You still ask about team results and team pipeline, but then we're not asking the manager about activity. We're asking the manager about talent management and are you dealing with the underperformer and tell me what you're doing with our top people and have you gotten in the field and what initiatives are you? So there's some bigger questions we want the manager. And honestly, your meeting with your sales manager is more than 10 minutes. That's probably 45 minutes or an hour because that's your most important person. If they're managing the people that are leading revenue for us, they got to, you got to hold them accountable for team results, for team pipeline, and then their initiatives. So just email me and I'll get you uh, I'll, I'll send you the dice. It's like a one page PDF. And Mike, could you just send that to Chris and Chris, can you send it to us? I can. Yep. I can. Right. And Mr. Simon, you've been so patient and quiet. What's on your mind or what question do you want to ask since you've been? Oh, well, I mean, I, you know, we, we work this pretty hard. I mean, I, I've been fortunate. We deal with a person that we've been doing for a long time on S called SPS Gaskin team. So it's success by selection and ask is working on an attitude, skill or knowledge. And then team is how do you develop teams? So you're you're right into what we're talking about. We just have different time frames when you're looking at right. running your day to day. You know, when you're looking at these things. But I every we you know same thing we struggle with. We just map out discovery documents and we map out what the people are doing. I think what I like about what you're saying more is to get it more where the people know it and there's a time and everything else. I think we're kind of one of those ones where we're off in different areas. Yeah. That's good. If that's the one takeaway from this is something formal for kind of, that's great. But I love that you care enough to equip the team with that, that type of methodology where there's a, a process to follow and they should be able to ask the right questions and do what they need to do. It, that, I mean, the other thing we do is because it's always funny to me when you, when you sit down and people think we do lost sale reports. We also track, you know, I mean, a lot of different things on that. And it's always funny mm -hmm. to me. People said, well, I lost a lot of sales. And we'll pull that out. I mean, most of these people didn't lose five sales or 10. They weren't in enough. And that really kind of opens their eyes and, and just shows it to them. It's not just really giving them facts. 
And That's then we so write good. letters to those people. Everybody, anything that we would lose, we write a letter and I'll sign it to that customer and wow. thank them for their time and giving us the opportunity. We think things change. And That's a lot of wisdom there. Yeah, I agree with you, by the way. They inflate, people inflate their losses because they're insecure or they want to blame price or they want to blame the competitor or the stupid customer because the pipeline wasn't fat enough. I do work for John Deere. They've hired me a lot and they work with their dealers and they track this thing they call participation. And it's easy in the equipment world because all equipment gets registered. So they know if a piece of construction equipment was sold because it ends up being registered with motor vehicles or the, or the farm bureau or whoever. And they are all over their dealer salespeople that you can't just babysit your friends and you tell me you got the market territory because we keep seeing the reports coming in of these other customers that are buying equipment and we weren't even at the table because you weren't making sales calls. We weren't even involved in the deal. We're not even losing. We're not even participating, <laughs> you know? And so there's this, this wake up call, like, don't tell me, you know, you're so busy servicing accounts and we're doing, because there's deals going on in your area that you're not even at the table participating in which goes back to where we started, you need a good list. And we need people proactively working accounts before they're shopping. I tell my, my sales teams I'm working with, if they're asking you for a quote and you aren't involved on the front end, you're already late. No. You're playing catch up, you're getting commoditized. The competitor's guy was there making a friend, laying traps for you, painting a picture of a better future. And now you're just a, you're column fodder, right? You're, you're the honest price guy and that sucks. So I don't know if you guys resonate with that. Like I, I don't play that game. You know, I got a, I got a lead last week. True story. Someone sends me a note and says, Mike, we're looking for someone to speak at a sales kickoff at the end of March. What, what are you available? And what's your price? You know, my response was who canceled on you? That was my response. Tell me who canceled on you and then I'll talk to you. And I got a funny note back. Okay. You got us. Cause I, I wasn't their first choice. They went down some other path. I'm like, well, what are you trying to get done? And then I ended up in a whole discovery conversation. I ended up winning the deal because I was able to sl slide it in the last day I had opened the whole quarter, but it's, we're not proactive enough. And we have a generation of salespeople that have figured out like there's a way to make a living sitting on your ass, being fed good leads or chasing a few people and loving on your friends. And they're not out hungry, turning over rocks like trying to blow it away. And our job is to get the right people that are hungry, that are competitive, that keep score, that are not afraid of conflict. And we hold those people accountable and we pay them smart where when they win, we win and good things really happen. So. Mike, I gotta, I gotta jump. Chris, thank you so much yeah. for investing in the dealer channel. You do such a good job of always looking for ways to serve us. And uh, Mike, I registered, I'll be listening to your podcast and spreading the word That's out awesome. to people because I like things that are simple that I can do. Uh, I don't like complicated systems. And thank you for copying someone else's good idea and sharing it with the rest of us. <laughs> I do it all the time. I got like one original idea. So thanks I have gentlemen. Feedback, Kevin. Yeah, thanks for joining me. I I'll pivot back to Chris here and just say it was really fun visiting with you today. Yeah, yeah. No, I thought it was a great time. And, you know, with just a few of us on here, I'm just curious, you know, I talked about at the beginning that type three knowledge and even stuff that we have here, uh, that'd be the biggest thing that came from this conversation with Mike away with some type three knowledge. I'm curious if you did and what, what was it? I found we're doing a lot of things, right. And we're doing a bunch of things that we need to tweak and improve. And, uh, the other, depending on the industry, they're not too far off on what we're doing and how we're doing things. And a salesperson, a good salesman is a good salesman is a good salesperson. And uh, the uh, the key is not to have a good salesman fail because you're you're failing them and managing them properly. I, I hope what you took away makes all the difference for you moving forward this year. I think the idea of separating the coaching and the accountability Great piece is, is the best takeaway I've seen today. Uh, and I think it's in terms of the types of knowledge, it's amazing how often it's successful <clears throat> to relearn or re reinvigorate knowledge you already have. And, and I think that a lot of this is that some of it is, is brand new, but, but a lot of it are things we've been taught for 30 years.
Yeah. I, and it's funny. I love that you said that the, the takeaway of separating those two pieces. I had to get used to this because my books, my first two books are called Simplified, right? New Sales Simplified, Sales Manager Simplified. When I lead a workshop, I mean, I get paid stupid money. If you if you saw what people, big companies pay me to show up somewhere and talk for an hour or for a day, it's, it's I can't believe it. It's just what, it's what the market pays. But I tell you what I had to get used to when I'm done. Nobody comes up to me and goes, you're brilliant. I got 94 new ideas. You know what I hear? Like, yeah, thanks for the wake up call. Yeah. We remember, we used to do that, but we forgot. Or I knew those were the basics, but we were playing with you know tools and tricks. And they're like, thank you for bringing me back to, tr to tried and true fundamentals. Like there's nothing sexy about this guys. There's no shortcuts. So we call that there, there's three P types of people. There's boors that boo everything. There's stewards that say, I'll get to that. And then there's doers. <laughs> what was the second phrase? The ones that said, I'll get to it. That's those. You got boors, stewards. Stewards. They're stewing on it. Yeah, that's good. I've never ever heard it that way. I'll be putting that on Twitter later. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, right, I gotta go. Uh, thank you. Lead. Thank you. Lead thank everybody. you, uh, Mike. Thank you, Chris. And thank you for my co uh, attendees. I appreciate you guys being on. Andrew, I'll see you in March. I'll see you in March. All right. All right. Take care, guys. All right. Thank you, fellas. Mike and Chris. Thanks a lot for all you do. Uh, my pleasure. And I'll I'll get the recording out next week. <laughs> thank you.